Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 683 for the 21st of Tishrei in a regular year. So one of the things that really distinguishes Judaism from most, if not all other religions, as far as I know, is the emphasis on the community, on the communal power as being superior to just the individual experience. So, you know, if you look at other religions, and not that I'm an expert in other religions, but from what I know of other religions, the emphasis does tend to seem that it's really on the individual spirituality. You know, you think about the Eastern religions uh, that involve a lot of self-meditation, Buddhism, Hinduism, stuff like that, uh, where there really is this, this emphasis on the individual attaining great spiritual heights. Even in a religion like Christianity, where um, or Islam, where we do see that there, you know, there are community events and things like that. Every religion has different community events. Nevertheless, there is something seen as like um, that. You know, there's something really sacred and something really. Um, praiseworthy in those religions about the priests, the monks, those people that really isolate themselves from the community and devote their lives to God. And there's sort of like this understanding that, you know, the community and these kind of things that are almost seen as an inconvenience in a way, maybe an inconvenience that we need as humans, but the ideal would be there's a sense that the ideal really would be to isolate oneself and devote oneself totally and fully, utterly to God. I actually had a conversation with a yoga with one of my yoga teachers a few years ago about this, where he actually openly admitted that he was, you know, he was very into uh, Eastern philosophy, yogic philosophy, and things like that. And he mentioned how he is married, and he saw this like the way he was describing it. It gave me kind of chills. Is that he? kind of saw this as like a detriment in a way. He said something like, you know, he's very into non-attachment, not being attached to anything in the world. And he said he did decide to get married, which, you know, does give him a certain form of attachment and not that he regrets the decision, but like he sort of acknowledges that this weakens his spirituality in a certain way. Uh, so this is so interesting in light of Judaism, because in Judaism, we all know that we really believe the exact opposite. Somebody cannot be a Kohen Gadol. And serve on Yom Kippur, which is like the highest position, the most important position in Judaism, if they're not married. Being married is a huge part of Judaism. Being part of a community is a huge part of Judaism. There are many different things that we can only do when we have a, a community of 10 men. We can only take Kaddish if there's 10 men, for example. So today we're going to continue along this theme. And we're going to talk about this idea of, you know, first, interestingly, the ultra is going to talk about the individual experience of spirituality. And he doesn't want to dismiss it because there is something to it. We don't want to just like poo-poo individual spirituality entirely. There's something in Judaism called reward and punishment. Uh, we don't tend to focus on that too much, especially in Chabad circles, but it's, it is a real thing. And reward and punishment really does have to do with our own individual um, service of God, our own individual spirituality, we can say. And so this is a real thing. And uh, and the altar is going to talk about this, what, you know, what it means to have your own individual service of God and what that looks like and what the reward is all about in that case. And how this has to do with the illumination of God's light into their soul. But then in the second part of today's section, the altar is going to contrast this with the divine indwelling that comes about when 10 men come together and learn, when 10 men combine their spirituality. And we see, we'll see that the 
the whole is really greater than the sum of its parts. And that it's not just about 10 individuals coming together and having this spiritual experience and having this godly energy seep into them in their own individual ways. And then it just creates this greater um, influx of, of godliness. But in fact, it's something so much greater. It's the power that is drawn down, this divine indwelling that comes about through 10 men getting together to do something holy is so great, in fact, that it can't actually become invested within their body in the way that uh, that that happens when an individual does it because the light is so great and we'll see that it's this this um, this radiance this indwelling is so great this hovering uh, energy that's created is so great in fact so that the angels actually get intimidated by it and they actually become very fearful they tremble in the in the wake of this indwelling so with all of that being said let's get into the text and see how the altar Rebbe explains all of this for context we're in the middle of epistle 23 of the garrison kodesh and so here we go so the altar Rebbe begins and he says the difference between hashra'a which is this idea of the indwelling versus the idea of receiving reward is understood by discerning thinkers. So we said again, Hashra'ah, this idea of the divine indwelling, that's what happens when you have 10 people studying together versus the idea of reward is just with one person studying on their own. So, okay, so what's the difference? So when it comes to this reward, so the reward is that the, um, is, is that God illuminates to the soul who seeks him. L'nefesh tidrshenu, it's called. This is a citation from Echa, chapter 3, verse 25. With the light of God's Torah, which is acts like a covering which in which God garb, garbs himself. So meaning that the light of Torah is considered to be like clothing that God garbs himself within. And this is why we know that the Torah is called or, it's called light. As it says... Uh, that's from Tehillim chapter 104, verse 2, which literally means he garbs himself in light as with a garment, meaning that Hashem guards, garbs himself with light. He, he uses light like a garment. So what does that mean? So there's an association with light and a garment and, and cloth, cloth, clothing, right? So, okay, so... How are we going to understand this? So when we think about the soul, we know that the soul is finite and limited in all of its faculties. So even though, yes, a soul, we think of it as very spiritual. Spiritual doesn't imply, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily infinite. Spiritual just means that it's not physical. Nevertheless, it still does have a certain limitation to it, a certain finitude to it. And so this is why we know that the light of God that shines within the soul is also going to be limited and it's going to be constricted and, um, and the way that it vests itself within it. So what the altar Rebbe is basically saying here, that when we talk about this idea that like when a person becomes infused with this godly light, it's going to be tailor-made to them. It's going to be really limited in, uh, in proportion to their soul. And this is why we see that these kind of people that seek a God are going to be, the, their hearts will be aroused to, during uh, prayer and that kind of thing. And their hearts will rejoice in God, and will uh, be and they'll rejoice in song. So, Afgilat Veranen, which comes from Yeshayahu chapter thirty-five, verse two, which means their hearts uh, will rejoice in Him and exult even with exultation and song, and their souls will delight with the pleasantness of God and with God's light. Uh, as it becomes revealed through the clothing that God clothes Himself, which is the Torah. And it will come out, come forth like a lightning. So this is a citation from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 14. And his arrow comes forth like lightning. And this is, and this is what we mean by this reward of the Torah that, uh, that comes about, uh, which for any soul that labors when a soul labors in Torah. So when an individual studies Torah on their own, not in a minion, not with 10 people together. So what happens is that they're drawing down the light of the Torah and that light of Torah is considered to be like a garment of God. And so it draws down into their soul in a very limited way, in a very specific way that's specific to their soul, which causes them to really feel this excitement for God, really feel this enthusiasm for God, which is a really great thing, right? So that is the subjective experience of spirituality that is gained through Torah study on one's own. So 
it's not to be dismissed. This is a very great thing to study Torah on your own and to basically uh, gain this subjective um, feeling, this subjective enthusiasm towards God. So that's that's the value and that's what happens. That's the reward that comes to a person who studies on their own. But now we're going to continue and we're gonna, and the altar is going to lead us through understanding what happens when a person learns not on their own, but actually together in a group, specifically a group of 10 and the effect that that has. So whereas the effect um, that the individual studying Torah, what, what happens there is what's known as har reward. When it comes to the effects of 10 men coming together, what that's referred to is Hashra, Hashra Tashchina, the indwelling of the Shechina. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So what is this Hashra? What is this indwelling? This is, says the Alter Rebbe, an intense illumination that comes from the light of God that shines uh, in the light of the soul without any end and without any limit. So this contrasts with the reward that comes to a person who studies individually, where this does come about in a limited way because the soul, even though it's spiritual, is limited nevertheless. And so the radiance that it draws down is limited and appropriate proportion to the soul. But here in this case, when we talk about the radiance that's drawn down, when we have 10 Jews, it's unlimited. It's not, uh, it's, it's without ends. And so since it's an unlimited radiance, it's not able to be vested within the soul, which the soul is limited, but rather it just encompasses it from above, from the, from its head to its feet. As the sages taught, a blessed memory taught, uh, and this is a teaching from the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 39a, where it says that the Shechina hovers over every gathering of 10 Jews. So it's specific, the wording is, uh, is specific that it's, it hovers above them. It doesn't, vest itself within them the way it does in uh when we're talking about the one jew studying torah and so and as it says in tehillim chapter 90 verse 17 quotes the altar up at where it says may the pleasantness of the lord our god be upon us established upon us the work of our hands so it's this idea of upon us resting upon us so it's from above meaning to say that the pleasantness of god which appears in the work of, of our hands, Ma'aseyadenu, through learning Torah and, and doing mitzvahs, this um this is this like hovers upon them. So okay, so why? Because we know that the Torah and God are one and the same. And so uh so it rests upon a person from above. When a person is involved in Torah study and mitzvahs, then since God and Torah are one and the same, then God rests upon them from above. Since God is without limit or ends, and thus God himself is not able to invest himself within our souls and within our minds in this limited way. And so this is why we don't understand with our intellects the sweetness of God, the pleasantness of God, uh, and the 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 ray, ray of the Shechina that is truly without limit and without, uh, without uh, and that's infinite. But rather, it just rests upon us through our work in Torah and mitzvahs, especially specifically speaking, when we do this in public, when we have when we learn Torah, when we're involved in mitzvahs in a communal way. And so and this says the altar, but this is what is referred to when we learn in the Gemara in Kedushin page 39b, this idea of mitzvah b'hai alma leka, that there is that. In this world, there's no reward for the performance of the commandments. So there's that word reward, right? So we talked about how an individual who sits and studies Torah on their own, they do receive a reward. That reward is that subjective experience of enthusiasm that they get that's very tailor-made and catered to their soul. But when we talk about the communal learning of Torah, there's no reward for that, meaning to say, at least not here in this world, because the, here we're talking about an infinite radiance, something that's coming from the Shekhinah, the, the radiance of the Shekhinah, which is infinite in nature, and that cannot manifest itself in our finite souls. So it has to uh, uh, encompass us from above. The world cannot comprehend it, but rather it can only, th this can only happen. The only way that we can comprehend these things is when we're, the soul is divested from the body and, and we're not in this physical, we're not bound by physicality here. The, the soul is not bound by the physical body down here. 
Uh, however, nevertheless, by way of kindness, so through a kindness, as it says, and this is a citation from Tehillim chapter 62, verse 13, where it says, Ulcha Hashem Kindness, O God, is yours, for you render to every man according to his work. So meaning to say that even though it really would not make sense for us to receive as a reward, meaning us to receive, we can we can um, equate reward here. We can make it synonymous with the idea of subjective experience. It's impossible f- for us to subjectively experience the Shrina, which is infinite right? That it's, it's kind of like, it doesn't make sense that we'd be able to do that. Nevertheless, due to the kindness of God, then we know that God actually gave this power to the tzaddikim to have this reward, to have this subjective experience in the world to come. So it's true that right now in this physical world, in this reality that we live in, we cannot experience this. We cannot have this ex- subjective experience of God, but nevertheless, God, out of kindness, he made it so that we could experience this, at least for the tzaddikim, they can experience this in the world to come, which is not the case, concludes the Alter Rebbe, in the case of the angels. As he said, he says that he, he learned from his masters, meaning the, the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid, which were the teachers of the Alter Rebbe, that if even one angel were to come and stand in amongst 10 Jews to get who were standing together, even if they were not speaking words of Torah. So if, if an angel came to a gathering of Tanjus who were just like hanging out, not even speaking words of Torah, these angels, that uh, a fright and a terror would fall upon them that would be so infinite and, and, um, and boundless due to the Shekhinah that was resting upon them that this angel would actually become nullified in his source completely. So... That's, yeah, so that's the end of the section. So once again, so just to reiterate this all, so the basic idea is that there is a very tremendous light that comes down and whenever 10 Jews come together, most, especially if they're learning Torah, if they're involved in mitzvahs, but even towards the end, it's even if they're just like standing together, if they're just hanging out together, the power of 10 Jews coming together to such an extent that this is something that we cannot experience subjectively because it's it's something that just it's it's uh, it's an unlimited radiance from the shrina so it cannot become manifest within our what is in our our uh, souls which are limited by our bodies so it's only something that people can experience uh, after they they pass away after they're no longer encumbered encumbered by their bodies and angels also cannot handle it. Angels can't handle it at all uh, because angels are much more sensitive and much more perceptible. So if an angel were to be in this within the vicinity of 10 Jews hanging out in this way, they would expire. A question does come up. I'll just leave this off as like a little addendum that the, the Rebbe brought this question up of like, you know, we do see instances of like angels being present when 10 Jews are around. So how does this work exactly? The Ultra Rebbe doesn't address this here and it doesn't, he doesn't answer this question, but it is kind of something just to think about. Um, you know, maybe it is answered somewhere else. How on the one hand, the altar was saying that he learned that an angel would not be able to handle Jews standing together and it would expire. But on the other hand, we know that there are instances that angels are around. So how does that work exactly? But the the main point that we should be left with is just uh, to really um, get a feeling, get a sense of just the loftiness and the intensity of the radiance that comes down upon Jews when we gather together in a group of 10. So that's it for today. And we will continue along these lines tomorrow. And I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak Ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, Please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.